came back, you know, I did a couple of things that, not that they were unprecedented, but they were unorthodox. One was we stopped reporting monthly comps. But in the first three months of me returning, I did something that probably had never been done before, and that is we closed every store for retraining. Right. And, and that turned out to be a, a PR bonanza, but it wasn't designed for that. What it was was an admission of guilt. We had to stand up to our people and our customers and say, you know what, over the years, there's been a dilution of quality. And to continue like this is a mistake. So we literally closed every store. The cost was millions of dollars. I came under tremendous criticism. And the competition really smelt blood, and they went after us. But it was, again, one of those galvanizing moments of demonstrating to our people and the marketplace that this was not going to stand anymore, that, in fact, we were going to significantly increase the qualitative measures. And that turned out to be another major turning point for the company. But even, even those types of bold moves, and the book is filled with bold move after bold move after bold move. And almost every single time, there's a group assembled who doesn't think you should do it and who um, questions you and challenges you. So for those of us who run enterprises of yeah. any size, yeah. should we ever expect that are the group of people who work with us should uh, sort of give us that credibility or are we only ever as good to Wall Street, to the people who work with us as our last right call? Well, I think, um, let me try and answer it this way. Um, I think great entrepreneurs must have the curiosity to, to kind of metaphorically see around the corner. What's coming? What can I anticipate that other people don't see. Um, and then you must have the courage of your convictions to execute the strategy. Every decision is different. And certain people have different insight and different skills. And in the book, I write about some things that I decided on my own that were wrong and that were you know, catastrophic in some ways. I don't always have the right decision. Now, when we brought in a new team, this is a world-class group of people who have skills and insight well beyond me. The decisions we're making today are more skewed towards consensus than they were in the past because of the trust of the team. However, I will make the final decision. And you reserve I, that right. And, I, and also, I will take the responsibility if that decision is wrong. Well, that's just happened with, uh, at least the way you describe it, with VIA. The, uh -huh. So you have a, a team working for, well, for a very, very long time. But as the product launch comes near, yes. VIA, the instant coffee product, um, and you've got these, a lot of great people working on it, maybe these very same people you're describing. But at some point, at some point, it ends up again back in your living room with a couple of uh, old consultants that you had worked with in the past where you say, let's get this right. Well, I think this is a great case study. Uh, the instant coffee category is a $24 billion category globally, has not had any innovation for over 50 years, and is dominated by one company. Uh, but... For a, for a company like Starbucks, whose image is based on high quality, specialty coffee, to go into the instant coffee category, one could assume would be a death sentence. And uh, when we announced we were doing this, the media and Wall Street just basically wanted to destroy me. And the headlines were terrible. But again, I felt we saw something that other people didn't see. But the litmus test for this is we had to replicate a, the taste of Starbucks coffee in an instant form. Once we cracked the code technolo with, with technology, I knew right away that this would be a success. V has been a runaway hit for the company, probably do $250 million as we sit today, and we haven't really begun to introduce it globally where 81% of the market is. So this is, this is a major hit for the company, and it also did something, and I think this is important. You know, not everything should be measured on its own merit. This, again, was an opportunity to rekindle and remind the organization about the entrepreneurial spirit and the courage of the company to take the road less traveled. And our people were so proud of the fact that we were about to do something that was against the grain that was going to succeed. And I don't believe there's any coffee company that could have done this other than us, not because we're better than anyone else, but because of the way in which it was positioned and obviously the, the passion we had to bring this to market in a very unique way.
Okay, let's do this. Today I'm going to teach you something about organization design. Let's have a closer look at organizations. Organizations are social systems of individuals whose interests, information, and knowledge differ. For example, in running a restaurant, some people know how to cook. Others understand how to treat guests, while a third group of people might be excellent at accounting. All these people know and are interested in different, often conflicting things. But they need to work together seamlessly to make a restaurant successful. Organization design provides the framework and shapes how a group of people gets the job done. First, organization design establishes the jobs, roles and responsibilities of its members. Who takes the order? Who suggests the wine? And who grills the fish? Second, organization design needs to motivate its members to act in the collective interest, to define what it means to do the job well, and then how to reward good performance. Finally, organization design helps companies to maintain a balance between routine and innovation. These organization design issues, coordination, cooperation and competence, are often easy to resolve for small organizations. But it soon becomes more complex when you consider companies such as Volkswagen, with more than half a million employees worldwide. Today, constantly evolving digital technologies open up the possibility for unconventional solutions that allow for new forms of working together.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Todd Screma, president of Summit Funding. Thanks for taking a moment to listen to this video. This is about what a Summit Funding sales team looks like. So I'm going to do a quick overview of what each team member does and what the first hires are. First of all, why is this important? If you're, if, if you're in the mortgage industry today, we have all know that the last five years have been crazy and loans are a lot tougher. If you're just a single loan officer, you're literally stuck at doing three, four loans a month. You can't do more than that consistently on average unless you have a team. So what does that look like? I'm going to do a basic overview of what a fully developed team looks like and I'm going to point out what the first hires are. The first step is you have obviously a loan officer. Now, Secondly, you, you, some teams have what we call a team captain. A team captain is someone that manages the team. It's really an LP2 that's good at management and leadership. This is highly developed. This is for teams that are closing 20 plus loans a month. The first hire for a team is what we call a loan partner two. Now, that loan partner two is licensed, as you know, in Summit Funding, and they take that loan from application all the way through closing. So, yes, they do sometimes take loan applications, they gather conditions, they lock loans. They literally take care of that loan from the date of application all the way through closing. It's a very important position. That's the first hire for the team because as a loan officer, you need help with all of that stuff. And if once that person frees you up, you sell a lot more. Um, the second position is a loan partner one. This is kind of a secretary for the team. You start getting 50, 80, 100 leads a month into a loan team, it's literally a full-time job just to take the incoming calls, run credit reports, see who should come in for appointments. I used to tell my old assistant, they got over a 640 score and make a few thousand dollars a month, get them in here for an appointment, I'll meet with them. And it literally was that simple. So they just book appointments all day for you. So that's what a loan partner one does. Certainly more complicated than that, but that's a basic overview. I'm not really going to cover a director of business development right now. This is for bigger teams. This is for teams that are closing 20 plus deals a month. Some people don't have junior loan officers or what we call team loan officers. I'm not going to go into detail on that, but that's a loan officer that's in training, that's working on the team. The last position I want to call attention to is a sales coordinator or what the core calls a dialer. What this person does is they, they've agreed to work for a year for the loan team, just making a bunch of phone calls in exchange for you helping them learn the business and become licensed. So they literally fill up your lunch and learns, fill up your happy hours. They call your past clients and ask for refinances. They call on home builders and realtors to get you appointments for the first time. Uh, they, they, there's, I could go on and on and on. A dialer literally spends six hours a day on the phone overcoming their call reluctance and getting you a ton of appointments. So first hire for the team is a great loan partner too. By far the most important hire and the first hire that we have. Then you've got a loan partner one. The third hire is a dialer. So that's the basic overview and a little bit of overview of what a fully developed loan team looks like. Guys, take this. This is an amazing process. It does take time, but you'll be glad you did because we'll go from four loans a month to eight to 12 to 20 to 30. For the, for the first time in five years, I see people closing 30, 40, 50 loans a month again, and this is how they're doing it. Thanks, guys, for listening. Make it a great day.
If you come to some IT team, you are quite likely to discover a matrix structure within such a team or such an organization. And matrix structure, trust me, is a really interesting topic and really interesting organizational structure that company can undertake. So let's take a look at it. So by the definition, this is a structure in which people and resources are grouped in two ways simultaneously uh, by function and by project or product. So as you can see, we have a two ways simultaneously. So the first one is by function and second one is by project or product. And so we are getting to something very new and something very interesting, which is called a two boss employees. These are the employees who report to two superiors by the product manager and by the functional manager. And here you can see the connections. So we have product manager who is responsible for the project or product. And then we have a functional manager who is responsible for the function. So I think you got the basic idea, but let's take a look at an example of a such matrix structure. So as you can see, we of course have our CEO and then we have sort of two flows of responsibility. So we have two flows of responsibility responsibility of course we have this this vertical flow so we have vertical flow and then we have this horizontal flow and when we take a closer look you see we have a product team or so you can imagine yourself as being part of this structure let's say that let's say that you are right over here you are this employee or you belong to this product team now you are reporting, you are a two boss employee because you are reporting to the financial manager and as well you are reporting to the product manager. So now you can quite see it. This is a product, let's say, let's say we are producing, let's say we are producing some sort of a computers. So we are producing computers and this is our computer. We call it, let's say C15X. And now this wall horizontal line is producing this, our computer C15X. And you can see that there are various employees. There is this employee who takes care about the finance and is reporting to the financial manager. Then there is this employee who is reporting to the marketing manager and finally to the engineering manager. So I think you got the idea. And then as well, we have, we have our vertical flow, which looks like this. And that is basically our finance function or our financial department. And the people from financial department are sort of spread it all over our company or all over our the, the, the rest of the products. Now, this kind of function has certain advantages and as well some disadvantages. So let's take a look at them. So advantages overcome problem of subunit orientation. If you remember what is a subunit orientation um, said very simply, uh, people or units within our organization will only think about themselves and sort of will, will see things only from their perspective. So this can happen, for instance, in marketing so that uh, uh, people who are involved in the marketing will not think about the financial part. They will want to invest hugely into marketing, but they will not recognize that we do not have enough financial resources or they will not acknowledge the engineering needs. So thanks to this matrix structure, we can overcome this problem of a subunit orientation because as you can see the employees will be communicating a lot then it allows people to learn about other functions so as you can imagine if you are right over here this employee you will learn about marketing because you are in a close contact with such, such a person from a marketing department and you will as well learn about the engineering then a quick transfer of valuable employees so if you were if you were here and your managers were happy with you, then you would be moved down to another product or, or to another division where they would be again happy with you and maybe even to the third product. So there is a quick transfer of these valuable employees. And then it promotes a concern, and this is important, for both cost and quality. So if you are here, 
imagine that that you should be concerned for both the cost and quality and how that happens well your product manager is going to push for the quality so they will want as high quality of product as possible and on the other hand your financial manager is going to push on lowering the costs so you most likely are going to be concerned about both now of course certain disadvantages it lacks the bureaucracy because of lacking standardization and hierarchy when you look at it um, let me just find some interesting call when you look at it let's say uh, from this employees perspective how many hierarchical levels do we have well this is the first hierarchical level then we have a manager so it's a second hierarchical level and then comes the CEO, which is the third level. So as you can see, this organization is really flat and due to that, it can lack the standardization and hierarchy. Now, conflicts between functions and product. This is thinly related with this about advantage. So on one hand, every employee is going to be concerned for both cost and quality, but on the other hand, a conflict can occur because of this. Your product manager will imagine, hey, we need a higher quality of our product, but the financial manager will say, no, we don't have money for that. And finally, this is hard to design and manage the relationships. So you can imagine that it will be quite hard to actually find such people who will fit into these products and into these functions. So it is not easy to design a matrix structure within your organization, but as you can see, it has a lot of interesting advantages. Hello, I'm Jennifer Witt, Director of ProjectManager.com. Well, welcome to our whiteboard session today on what is project management? Seems like a crazy question to ask, but if you see some of the questions out on the forum and in some of the discussions we have with some of our clients, it's easy to understand how it gets confused because project management sometimes is defined in our corporate environments or our other environments and different opinions that are, I don't know, gathered all around the world. So you know me, I like to start with a clear definition to start things out right. So my uh, normal uh, reference is Google. You'll always see me say, go to Google to research something, to look something up. To, my reference today is from uh, a guide. It's a guide from Project Man a guide to the Project Management Body of Knowledge. It's the fourth edition by PMI, the Project Management Institute. So you may have other references that you want to uh, seek out, but this is mine for today. So the PMBOK guide, or a guide to the project management body of knowledge, fourth edition by PMI says, what, a, what project management is, is the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to the project activities to meet project requirements. So if we look at this graphically, we have project activities that are going on, and then we're producing the project requirements, the scope, the deliverables. And then so we're inputting in our knowledge as the project manager, knowledge, our skills, different tools we use, different techniques. Those are applied against the project activities. There's some kind of application process going on, a lot of different things going to produce these requirements. So I want to break down some of these terms too because People use them interchangeably, so want to be clear on what these are because a lot of times you'll see mention of these different words, different uh, references, different lists, the top uh, skills, the top tools that are needed. So let's get clear on the different components because I believe, and we at Project Manager believe, it's a combination of all four of these. So knowledge. Now if you go to my good friend Google and search what knowledge means, you can see a lot of different references. You can pull up pages and pages of what this means. This is my favorite one that came up. 
so knowledge is what is known in a particular field. It's learned through education. So most of us are doing projects for specific industries. And because we do projects for maybe specific industries, we have a background knowledge. We've had ex um, experience and we've had different education on our industry, whether it's healthcare, whether it's construction, it may be information technology, it may be green projects, it could be uh, aeronautical, it could be anything. So uh, the knowledge is what's known in a particular field. So the skills required are, a it's a particular, a skill is a particular ability. It's our expertise. It's ability to do something well. It's arising from either a, a talent that we have, a training, or even practice. So our skills that we have in project management, you can see some of our other whiteboard sessions on some of the top skills required. But in order to hone those skills uh, more effectively, we need training and it's practice. Just like any other sports figures or for artists or for many other people, to hone your skills or to make them better, it's constantly learning, it's constantly growing. Some of us have, again, an innate talent, but we take those talents and we continue improving them with, with training and practice. Also, tools. What is a tool? So this uh, definition is what I pull because commonly we think of something tangible, something tangible we can put in our hand. So one of the definitions was a device or um, a device held in one's hand or used to carry out a particular function. So some of the tools that we commonly use could be software, it could be a software tool, something that we access by the internet or our desktop. Uh, a tool could be an Excel spreadsheet, it could be Microsoft Word, it could be different tools like that that we use to apply to our project. And the last one is a technique. It's a way of carrying out a particular task. So when we think of techniques, we think of methodologies, we think of processes, we think of frameworks that are required. So again, these four components are all used to contribute to towards the project activities. And as you know from being a project manager, um, it takes a lot to hone these four components, our knowledge, our skills, our tools and techniques. These are the things that we do um, in, as a project manager to actually manage our projects more effectively. So this is what project management really is all about. So I hope you get familiar with these four components and help to develop them on your own. At projectmanager.com, we feel strongly about these four components and we built them into our tool. So if you're looking for a tool to help you manage your projects more effectively, then sign up for our software at projectmanager.com. Aren't all approaches to managing projects created equal? Aren't all project management training programs pretty much the same? If you're trying to manage projects in a matrix, the answer to both of these questions is a resounding no. In a matrix, projects are led by a project leader who typically has no authority over some or all of the people on her team. That requires the project leader to generate buy-in and ownership from the team members, so they will commit to producing the deliverables needed for the project to succeed. The problem is that most project management methods are directive, not collaborative in approach, and do not engender commitment. So what exactly is a directive approach? When a leader leads a team directively, she collects input from the team members and then develops a project plan that incorporates some or all of that input. She then reviews the plan with the team, where typically each member of the team highlights those activities that have his name on them, hoping he has the time and support from his boss to complete them on time. In a directive approach, the project leader owns the project plan and any problems that arise during its execution. The directive approach does not create ownership or commitment, and this is a disaster in a matrix. Not only are team members not committed to their piece of the project, but they don't understand the interdependencies, how their piece fits into the big picture, or who they are depending on and who is depending on them. 
in a matrix, you need to use a collaborative project management approach. In a collaborative approach, the project leader does not create the plan. Instead, she leads the team through a collaborative process so the team creates the plan. As a result, the plan created is something the team can commit to. It's one they own. When this is done correctly, the project team members are committed to and are accountable for the project's success. The collaborative approach requires the project leader to shift from planning, directing, and controlling to facilitating the project management process with the team. This requires a new approach to project management and a new set of skills. How do you get project leaders to act as facilitators instead of directors? The most effective way is through training, hands-on, experiential training. Effective training for project leaders in a matrix teaches the leader what the steps in a collaborative project management method are and how to lead a team through those steps. Effective training allows the project leader to practice each of the key project management tools, such as doing a work breakdown structure, assessing risk, creating a schedule, etc. But instead of doing those activities herself and compiling a project plan, she learns how to create the plan with her team. Effective training is training that can be immediately applied to the real-life projects that leaders face when they leave the classroom. It's training that gives project leaders new skills that they will use on the job every day. So ask yourself these questions. One, is the standard project management method you've adopted directive or collaborative? Two, is the training you're using teaching project leaders a collaborative or a directive approach to managing their projects? Three, does your training prepare project leaders to pass an exam? or to collaboratively lead a team through the four phases of any project. Managing projects collaboratively is one of the first steps in moving up the Matrix Management 2.0 maturity ladder. Most organizations start at level zero, where directive leadership is the norm. At level one, they're using collaborative leadership tools and methods on all projects and initiatives. The Matrix Management Institute offers collaborative project management training that will help you move up to maturity model level one and that will improve the performance of projects almost immediately. To learn more about our Matrix Maturity Model and collaborative project management training, visit our website or give us a call at 512-900-5511.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the seminar. Our keynote speaker today, Peter Senji, is a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management. He's a world-leading systems thinker who, among his many accomplishments, has developed the notion of a learning organization. In 1997, Harvard Business Review identified Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline, as one of the seminal management books of the previous 75 years. For this work, he was named by Journal of Business Strategy as the strategist of the century. Please give a warm welcome to Peter Senji. So first off, let me say it's a great honor to be here as part of this celebration. What you all have done in building this center is really very inspiring to us around the world.
1980s, a young marketing executive named Howard Schultz came back from a trip to Italy with an idea. How about marketing espresso coffee drinks to Americans? He was working for a little specialty coffee company at the time, a Seattle company called Starbucks. When Starbucks execs didn't go for his idea, Schultz started his own coffee house and later bought the Starbucks name. And the rest is business history. In 1982, Schultz was working for Starbucks as the director of marketing, and the store was nothing like the brand we know today. Founded in 1971, Starbucks was a small coffee bean retailer in Seattle, specializing in unique blends from around the globe. Starbucks was known for its knowledgeable staff, which sold excellent, perfectly roasted coffee bean. The trademark Starbucks logo is an image of a two-tailed siren. In Greek mythology, it is widely known that a siren is a seductive female figure. Sirens are associated with desire, temptation, and are known to be irresistible. When one sees the Starbucks siren, it is supposed to make you want to buy their irresistible coffee and to evoke a strong desire to fulfill your longings. The Starbucks siren logo has been so successfully associated with coffee itself that anyone with the desire to drink coffee will immediately associate the siren image with a delightfully steaming hot cup of coffee. Starbucks has created a brand identity with the siren logo sense of belonging, and loyalty to the logo itself. By the 1990s, Starbucks was opening a new store every day. And today, it's the largest coffee house company in the world. Starbucks grew into an iconic brand in the U.S. and over time has developed many stores all over the world, catering to the demands of the country in which they are located. Global expansion is essential to successful companies. Starbucks is no exception. In 2003, Starbucks quickly expanded into foreign markets and began to evolve into the worldwide company we know today. Globalization helped Starbucks become the coffee shop powerhouse it is today. What's different between Asia and Europe is that Asia, coffee consumption is not as big versus Europe. So you've got the other side of the challenge in Asia where we're trying to get people to drink more coffee through our experience. Whereas in Europe, coffee consumption is already a behavior. It's really pro providing them with another option of how to experience that. The brand's success in new communities depended on built-up anticipation among local consumers who would become excited about welcoming Starbucks to their towns because of the attraction of having a trendy cafe environment for relaxation and personal enrichment. Starbucks is a worldwide coffee company that has transformed the image and emotion connected to coffee. The Starbucks logo of the siren has created a sense of brand loyalty and a strong group of devout Starbucks followers. The success and diaspora of Starbucks in the United States has led to the globalization of the company and the transformation of the availability of coffee to the average person. Starbucks has an extensive menu which allows the company to adapt to the demands of the culture they are in, making them a successful globalized company.
to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. According to Coca-Cola, as they entered the last quarter of the 20th century, their deep emotional bond with their consumers grew even more powerful and more global. In 1971, young people from around the world gathered on a hilltop in Italy to sing I'd Like to Buy the World a Coke, a counterpoint to turbulent times. This was also a glimpse into the company's future, an expanding global presence, and an even closer attachment to the world's most cherished trademark. How does the Coca-Cola system maintain and demonstrate these ideals? The Coca-Cola system is able to do this by maintaining a high level of competition between their distributors to spur innovation. Coca-Cola is a franchise, allowing them to license their products only to companies they wish. This helps maintain a high competitive level. These customers, also known as franchisees, are then responsible for any further production or distribution of their product. These bottling companies are the ones who must incorporate the integration of markets and innovation of technology into their production methods in order to compete with their industry. Once Coca-Cola has sold the product, it is the bottler's responsibility for further production, packaging, and distribution methods. The brand that is able to integrate these markets most cost-efficiently will be the most profitable. The brand that is most innovative in these methods will remain the most profitable in the industry. Thank you. 